it's important to understand the struggle because the truth is we're always in the struggle. Cincinnati in the 90s. It's a hell of a decade in Cincinnati in the 90s. The very foundations of our society are in danger of being burned. We're sick and tired of being abused and beaten and bashed and killed. We refuse to be quiet. Homosexuality is incompatible with military service. This is a human rights issue. He said, I have a dream today. And when he spoke about the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners, he made no distinction between the straight ones and the gay ones. What was the impact as you start to, you know, find out about sexual orientation protections in 1992? Because it, it wasn't something that was done with fanfare, you know. Let's was... tell each other the truth here, though. I mean, really, you want to talk truth? There were guys who were very powerful and Proctor and only got more powerful who didn't want to give equal rights to the LGBTQ community. We didn't deserve it. So moving to Cincinnati was a challenge for me. I really wanted to help a city like Cincinnati change, because if I could help Cincinnati become more LGBTQ friendly, that can spread. I wanted to make that change. I was dedicated to making that change in the world. So Cincinnati was my battleground. <laughs> At PNG, sexual orientation was added to the EEO policy toward the end of 92. You know, it was a big thing for PNG at the time, given its conservative nature. It was a big day. I read it and couldn't believe it. I, I honestly couldn't believe my eyes. I think I walked out a second time to reread it to make sure it was real. There's beginning to be that feeling of, we're going to be free. And boy, how wrong we were. So it's not like, boom, you've got this anti-discrimination thing, and now it's going to be, you know, Bambi at the still blue lake. It just doesn't work that way. PNG almost did that. They almost put sexual orientation in the policy as a bit of a legal thing. That's exactly right. It wasn't like they were planning to do anything different once they got the word in. There was no program or policy that I can remember that, that went with it, none. The initial perception was that it was a win. Yeah, but it was not. It provided recognition to employees that we existed. It actually got worse during that time. When I would walk into the ladies' restroom, most of the people would walk out. If I sat down at a tape, one of the long lunch tables, they would get up and leave. And then at the same time, in Cincinnati, you get this referendum that passed, putting in the so-called Article 12 in the city's constitution. Article 12, oh God, Article 12. Ugh. Issue three represents discrimination, and we're not going to tolerate discrimination in our community. Article 12 prevented protection for gay people in employment and housing within the city of Cincinnati. Specifically excluded gay people as a protected class. It seems like you're making it up because it's so crazy. It said that city council was disallowed from passing any legislation that would protect gay people from discrimination. Now, that's not how it was on the ballot. The people that put it on the ballot control the language. They would have this laundry list of hot button terms. You can't create special rights for gay people. You can't create quotas. Really, having a house is special rights? Mm -hmm. Having a job and not feel like they could just walk in and say, we really don't like you. I actually once was asked to describe to a group of PNG women from around the world what it's like to be gay, what the experience is like. And the way I described it was, it is to never know when you're going to be hunted and therefore you always have to be prepared that this is the day that somebody decided that your well-being is a threat to their happiness. Not only did Article 12 pass, but two-thirds of the voters in Cincinnati voted for it. I remember walking through the halls of PNG and thinking, the majority of you voted for this. You went out of your way to make sure that I don't feel secure in my job or my housing. I don't know that I was ever as mad again as I was the day after Article 12 passed and I walked in and said, I'm going to make change happen in the halls and walls of, of my employer. 
I started looking for my community, for LGBTQ people in PNG who I could relate to. And I ended up um, finding the potlucks. Enough of us had kind of chatted and, and said, hey, you know, if this is something that's recognized by PNG, it's in our equal employment opportunity policy, we should feel free to associate as a group of gay and lesbian employees. What happened with me is I was playing in a volleyball league that happened to have Gary Wright in it. And he said, I've sort of noticed that you're blatantly out. Do you have any interest in being a part of this group? And I'm like, absolutely. I mean, it really was part of my journey even before PNG and that I wanted to continue of actively working to, to create the world I want to live in. I had just moved back to Cincinnati with the family and um, it was difficult. So I wanted to have the chance to make a difference. Part of what Gary brought was he could talk his way around a lot of things. He was very comfortable with leadership. He was really good at that subtle stuff. That was one of his superpowers. So five of us came together to talk about what we wanted from the company. That was the start of everything, was those meetings. During that time, Article 12 emboldened even more name calling and threats like, you know, that posturing. I remember walking with our director at PNG, and we had passed a, a newspaper stand, and there was a headline about gays wanting to, like petitioning to parade or something like that. And um, he said, oh my God, those people should all just go to an island. If you're in the closet, you can't be bringing all your energy to the workplace because you're holding some of that energy to protect your own identity, your own sense of safety, I think. So the five of us got together there was discussion around the interest of saying, hey, you know, this is great to have this PEO policy, but there are actions in the workplace that we need to address, and there are further things that can be done in deploying policy. First, we need an identity. I mean, we work in a branding company. Let's get serious. I started just playing around with logos and names so that we could come up with some way to refer to us that wasn't necessarily like flashing red lights, the gay group. So we started calling it Gable. Sort of the idea of the gable of a house being a roof and protection and a gathering place over the people. So it had a little bit of meaning for us as a word and a name. The letters reflected who we wanted to be. Table being formed in the mid-90s was a big deal. Even for someone like me, I felt maybe I'm not totally alone anymore. There's a number of what the company was beginning to call diversity groups. You know, women managers or African Americans. Affinity groups at Procter & Gamble typically had an ION conference, and it stands for inter-office network, so that they could communicate among one another. So there was a normal process for requesting an ION conference for a group. So I just filled out the form and submitted it, and we got our ION group. The ION conference was really a, a way of saying we would be officially recognized. We had it all going. We were, we were cooking with gas, and then whoosh, just got cut off. This is an inappropriate use of company resources. Based on what? I mean, the, the funny thing was, there was no process that existed. They had to create it to say no to us, basically. But that's how it got to be the significance that it was. It wasn't that to begin with. It was just an ION conference. Everybody was part of like 18 ION conferences. But I mean, that's really what led us to like standing up and saying, we want to formally we want these ask three, for these three things. things. Yeah. The three requests were that first we wanted gay and lesbian issues included in diversity training. The second one was the ION conference. And then the third one was domestic partner benefits. Domestic partner benefits was always the, uh, the core that held us together. It was of universal importance to us. So what we decided was we'd, we'd start at the very top of the company. We wanted to go to the top HR person. We sent him a letter and requested a meeting with him to talk about what we wanted. He sent us back a note basically saying, I don't meet with groups like yours. I have my direct reports do that. Come on now. Cut me a break. What we realized was that he had just given us permission to approach every single one of his direct reports and say, your boss said we're supposed to meet with you. 
So we wrote Lavelle Bond and said, we're a group of PG employees, we're lesbian, gay, and bisexual, and we'd like to meet with you to talk about that. He wrote back to us and said, you can meet with my associate VP, Waldo Jeff. I wasn't in that organization a week before I received a call from Heidi Bruins. I don't even know where the bathroom is in this organization yet, and you're already calling me to begin the battle in the global world with sexual orientation. <laughs> Walla was there, and he was writing an agenda on the whiteboard, and his hand was shaking. He was so nervous. I really didn't know what to expect. He might have been scared, of us that first meeting, but he listened, and that was really evident in who he was. If you're being discriminated against, I have learned you have to fight back. I was born in segregated New Orleans. I have seen exclusion and discrimination at a very early age. If gays and lesbians at P&G are willing to stand up for themselves and fight for their rights. I sure know what it's like to do that. When this young lady, Heidi Bruins, got in my ear and said, well, do you know nobody else is going to advocate for us but you? I knew that she was right. At p and the whole idea is that you're sharing data. We're all about the data. For over 160 years, Procter & Gamble has been selling its products to gay and lesbian consumers, but we haven't talked about it much. We did the research, found out what other companies were doing, understood the tax implications and the costs that they had incurred. We would have these binders that would, would have a lot of information, the kinds of questions that people ask. You know, how much is this going to cost? Who does this affect? Why should we do this? Where is the justification for it? Just to help people to make their decisions in our favor, to, to side with us, was the idea. It was pretty much a resistance initially. One time, one of the vice presidents came into my office and shut the door and told me that he was concerned that uh, I was beginning to create an environment in the company that was immoral and he would never support, and that uh, my working with top management on that had to cease, or he personally was going to see to it that I was terminated. What that incident taught me was how we use power to bully. One of the objections that we heard is that you're, you're telling us about these things that happen in these far off places. They don't happen in Cincinnati and they don't happen at P&G, but because of Article 12, they actually did. So we started collecting people's stories. I was so scared that the powers that be at P&G would find out I was gay that for like seven years, in addition to lying by omission about my lifestyle, I actually manufactured a wedding and a husband. That, of course, resulted in a very tangled web of lies, but my energy was totally focused on maintaining the lies. I had ulcers, paranoia, and a total loss of self-esteem. One time, they were in the throes of doing some mandatory training. And there was a manager, and he said, if I ever see any gay people, I'm just gonna kill them. I had had an international assignment. I, I'd lived for three years in Manila in the Philippines, and my partner was there with me. We had to figure out how to have him be there living with me. There was no official uh, accommodation for a partner at that point in time. I mean, this was incredibly difficult. I was pretty proud of my family my three sons and the life we had built together. I never felt like my company recognized my family. That was the emotional toll. Financially, it was oppressive because I couldn't get insurance for two of the three children and my partner. We had to purchase 
insurance outside, and that was extremely expensive, probably $55,000 just in medical care for my family. And so what we did is we sent two people to meet with every single HR leader. And whenever they met with us, they're like, oh, you're like normal people. You look just like us. And then we'd share our stories. And that was the big thing that made a difference for so many people. You know, it was the difference between people like, I'm agreeing with this thing over here, or I'm disagreeing with this thing over here, and it would bring it into, I am looking at a real person. So this is where we went to Charlotte Auto and public relations so that you could look at it and say, okay, can the company manage the external communication of this without getting beat up? I think sharing his personal stories really took it from the intellectual, this is right for the business, to this is right for our people because we care about every individual because I got a personal understanding that took me from observer to advocate. Her role wasn't to say, we should go do this. Her role was to say, I can manage this. Here was the person in charge of the function that was responsible for making sure that the external communication wouldn't blow up in the company's face saying, we can manage this. And at that point, we had been working on this for many, many years. It was a very long process. Over the course of five years, we had prepared the environment to be able to accept another level of thinking. And at that point, we felt that we were pretty much ready to move forward. So we got the company to vote on same-sex benefits. It was an overwhelming vote of the yes. And unfortunately, the vote was not implemented. The answer came back a, a very disappointing, we won't be leaders. We will continue to benchmark and we will do this mid-pack. That was the exact language used with us, mid-pack. We felt defeated. It became apparent that through the grapevine that they were going to be offering insurance for pets. And I thought I was gonna die. There's no way my company can make a mistake like that to cover pets and not cover children. Back then I was the one senior manager who was now so there were people who did a lot more for gay rights at Proctor who really worked it, worked it so hard. And I can't say that I did. I just was trying to stay alive most of the time. I wasn't looking for people's approval. I was just looking for acceptance. All I want is a level playing field. Let me do good work and, and judge me fairly. Uh, I remember I got a call from someone who at that time I didn't know and his name was Gary Wright, and he came to my office, as he said he wanted to do, uh, to talk about a subject of diversity. And he came, and he had a couple of folks with him who I can hardly remember, but I certainly remember Gary. He said, John, I know you're very committed to diversity. That's obvious to us all, but you need to know that there is a huge outage in the way you are approaching diversity in this company. Well, that got my attention. And what he said he was talking about was that we were not recognizing the different way of life of our employees. Now, Susan Arnold was a very important person to me with the company. Susan and I had worked together in different parts of the soap business for years. And I never really thought about her marital or personal life one way or the other. And I really hadn't sat down with her and had a kind of conversation that, who are you, what is, what's your whole life like? Well, there was a, one of these dividend days, and I saw uh, Susan across the way, and she was sitting there with two young children and their partner. It came together for me in a particular way because I knew Susan in so many different dimensions, but I hadn't seen this. It was the importance of recognizing a person's full life and the importance of their having a choice on what that life would be. A.G. Lassley called, and he said to me, Susan, I promise you that we are going to get domestic partner benefits.
for P&G and for me, diversity is a business strategy. It's not just about doing the right thing, it's about doing right things right, and it's about building our business and our organization for the long term. At that point, having a company like P&G make a bold statement like that was incredibly powerful. When Procter & Gamble did it, it said something. It spoke volumes. It risked company boycott. It risked product boycott. It wasn't, it just wasn't that they did it right. They did it right, and they did it in the face of opposition. Focus on the family decided to declare a nationwide boycott of our products. And we had to go to the board because it did impact our business. And they were supportive. I mean, they didn't suggest that we back down at all. We may not have been first to the party, but we, uh, I think, threw a pretty good party. Same-sex partner benefits gave us the courage to step out even more, to take on Article 12. But it's each of those steps that have given us a stronger motivation and a stronger voice to be a positive force of change. Support for the repeal was the point at which P&G became more public about its commitment to equal treatment for LGBT people. It was the right thing to do. I don't know that anybody had a master plan for let's do this slowly and then this slowly and this slowly and keep that forward momentum. But what I think it says is there's a process we tend to follow and we may not get somewhere first, but we'll get there better. And ultimately, it sticks. But you look at the dramatic change of the original EEO policy, you look at the public announcement of the final domestic partner benefits, and you have the support for the repeal of Article 12. Those three were big changes over a fairly long period of time maybe over a 12-year period or so, but um, they were big changes, each one of them. I think the thing that I'm proud of is if people don't really want to think about being gay, if there's other things that they are, like a woman scientist or just a woman in general who's like a strong leader, they get to focus on those things. That's really the win for me, is that people don't have to think about it if they don't want to, and they can focus on the parts of themselves that they do want to focus on. To hear that Gable is 5,000 members strong and in 54 countries makes me want to cry. Um, I think back when there were, <laughs> there were just six of us, I don't know that I ever would have imagined a day like this would come we look just like you, and we talk just like you, and we are human just like you. Really, there's gay and lesbian people all around you here. <laughs> this is my poem that I wrote for my retirement. As a youngster growing up in the bowels of the Deep South, I had the passion for equality, and of course, this big, big mouth. Expected to be treated equal, equality had such huge appeal. All I ever really wanted was a level playing field. Those of you trying to become the best that you can be, use my experience at PNG as one last gift from me. Give more than you take, perform with passion and zeal, demand excellence and equality and a level playing field.